I walked into, I think, your FCA leadership meeting. Is that what I walked into this evening? All right, cool. And um, I saw the look on people's faces and just had a conversation with Will. Um, I just need to say this because I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I don't talk to anybody before I come. So whatever I'm going to say, however it resonates with you or whatever the situations are, I don't know what they all are. Um, but. When I asked God, what do you want me to leave them with? He said, these words, they are written in my Bible. They were written in my Bible before I came. But the words are, change is coming. So if you're a note taker, you can write down the words, change is coming. Because that's what the Lord wants you to know. There is a change. I don't know what that change looks like for you or for FCA or for any of us, myself included. I'm just telling you, when I was in this passage and praying for what the Lord would have me share with you, um, he said, tell them that change is coming. So verse 16 through 25 is where I'm going to preach from. I'm going to read that, then I'm going to pray, and then um, we'll sit back through this message. The Word of God declares in Isaiah 43, 16, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and the path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things that used to happen. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now I will bring it forth. Do you not know it? And will you not know it? I will even make a road for you in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and waters, uh, waters of rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. But you have not ca uh, called upon me, O Jacob. You have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me uh, no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to seal this message to our hearts that change is coming. Help us to see the context of this passage and how we fit into that context. Uh, whether we are people who are obeying you in the midst of what you're doing, or we are people who are wayward at this point, help us to see you for who you are, see ourselves for who we are, and see what you said about us that we might move forward no matter how slowly. And I pray that you would let it be known that you're God, that I'm your servant, that I'm saying all these things according to your will and according to your word. Speak things that only you could know so that when we walk away, use specific words that have been recurring in the lives of the people in this room that they might know that you are speaking directly with them and to them. I pray that you do that in the great and strong name of Jesus. Amen. Um, so as I was reading through this passage, you got to know the context of Isaiah first. Because this context is super important. Isaiah is a prophet that is prophesying during a time of several kings. But one of those kings happens to be Uzziah and another king is Hezekiah. What you need to know about these kings is that there are kings that have a, um, what I'm going to call amphibious walk with God. Y'all know what an amphibian is, right? They live in the water and they live on land. And so these kings are people who one minute will do exactly what God said and they kind of do the righteous thing. And the next minute they, they go in to do whatever they want to do. And so Hezekiah, for example, was a king who uh, had done a lot of things right. And then God tells him he's going to die, uses Isaiah to tell him that. And he says, Lord, look at what I've done for you. Don't let me die. So God gives him 15 more years of life. And in that 15 years, he decides that he's going to show other kingdoms his stuff. It just so happens then when he does that, the people of Israel get really arrogant. And as everyone is arrogant, God says, hey, you don't really respect me anymore. So just like any good parent, when a child is not being respectful, executes discipline, God executes discipline. Now, keep that as the backdrop because half of the stuff that I just read won't make sense unless you keep that as the backdrop. So first and foremost, he says that, that the Lord who is speaking is the one who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. And then he says, they'll lay down together, they will not rise. He is giving a picture of who, uh, so if you keep in notes, the way maker. Um, you probably have heard the song of the way maker. And that's who God is. 
the reason that Isaiah is bringing that up is because if you look through the book of Isaiah, the people of Israel are saying, but God, we're doing what you told us to do, but they're not. They're going through the form, they're offering sacrifices, but their hearts are not in it. Just like you know some people who may come to church, come to worship, they might do the Christian thing, but their hearts aren't really in it. They may be pursuing, the way that I used to say it um, is that they are pursuing God like a one night stand. Like the reality is they need God to do something for them. So they're pursuing him really, really hard to get him to do that thing. But their hearts are not really with him. They're not really in the word. They don't really care about who he is. They don't really think about his majesty. They don't see him as the rock and the way maker. They see him more as an ATM machine or a vending machine. Where it's like, hey, I make deposits and then you need to do stuff for me. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 40, they say we fasted, we've done all of these things and you're not even looking our way. And what the Lord says is, have you actually fasted? He says this as well in Isaiah 58. What he tries to get them to understand is they're fasting because they want something from God. When the point of a fast is not for you to get what you want from God, the point of a fast is you deny yourself and say, God, whatever your will is, that's what I want. So I don't know if you've ever fasted or people have encouraged you to fast, but often people will take a scripture out of context where the disciples are trying to heal a man who is demon possessed. They can't heal him. Jesus comes, he casts him out. And they say, why couldn't we do it? And he says, because this one only goes out with fasting and prayer. Many people have taught that you got to fast and you got to pray in order to cast the demon out. And that's not what Jesus was saying, Not at least not what I think. When you read through the scriptures and you read through in Isaiah 58, you learn what fasting really is. I think what Jesus was saying is y'all want it so bad to cast the demon out that you didn't really ask God what he was doing. A part of the fast and the prayer is to empty self completely so that you didn't only want what the way maker wants. Now, I don't know where you find yourself tonight. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, walking with him. If you're a non-believer, not walking with him, trying to figure out what this Christianity thing is. Here's what I do know. A lot of us don't see God for who he is. We see him more for what we want to get from him. And so Isaiah, what Isaiah is doing is reminding them who God is. Hey, this is the very God who performs miracle, whom the God whom you've seen work before, the God whom you've seen do amazing things before. That's the very God that you are saying you're doing stuff for, but you actually are not. I want to back up for just a second and read to you verses 10 through 15, because I think it will provide some more context. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am the one. Before me, there is no God formed, nor after me shall there be any God formed. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me, there's no other Savior. I've declared this, I've saved you, I've proclaimed it, there's no foreign God among you, therefore you are my witnesses. What is he saying? You've watched me do this. I'm not new to this, true to this is what he's saying. He's saying, I'm God, I've always been God. I don't delegate the responsibility of being God. And if you haven't made the connection, some of you right this second are thinking about things in life and trying to make a way for yourself. And God is saying, look, hold on, I got you. Last October at this time, I was in a vehicle headed back from Kent State. It was actually two days from now because I think today is the third. And I think some of you heard me tell this story. We needed to raise money for city kids to make sure we were straight toward the end of the year. And we had heard that we were getting a $400,000 check. And we heard we were getting that in July. And it was October and we hadn't gotten the check yet. So I started getting nervous. My director of finance was telling me we need finances. So I had pulled out my phone to start calling people to start raising money. And as I pulled it out, it was about four or five in the morning. I was headed back from Kent State University after talking to the athletes, just like I'm talking to you. And the Lord said, hey, I got you. And I was like, I know you got me, but I also know some people. So like, maybe we can work together and raise this money. You ever done that with God? Where you hear him say, I got you, but you're like, I know you got me, but like, do you need help? Well, he got, <laughs> he's not need help. So I, to be incredibly honest with y'all, I did not put my phone down at that moment. I still had my phone in my hand. I was getting to call somebody specifically or text that person to at least. And I'm thinking, yo, just sending a text, ain't nothing wrong with that. And the Holy Spirit says, either I got you or I don't, but I got you. So I'm like, all right, cool. I put my phone down. I turn up music. I'm worshiping for two and a half hours. As I go home, I go straight to my office. I sit down in the office. I open my Bible. I'm reading the word. And my director of finance, I'll never forget this. He bursts into the door and he says, it's 700,000, bro. It's 700,000. And I was like, what? He said, it's 700,000, bro. It's 700,000. He just kept saying it's 700,000. So I was like, what are you talking about? He said, the check. 
The check that they sent was $700,000. What? Can I see it? He had the check in his hand. I looked at the check because I'd never seen a check that big before, right? But they had provided 300000 more than what they said they would provide. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said at that moment, I said, I got you. I, I'm, I'm telling you, this is the God, the way maker that right now you might be thinking, how are we going to in some area of your life? He's the way maker. Don't ever forget that. Change is coming. This March, I was in a meeting with our director of finance and our director of facilities. Um, and he said, hey, I've done my projections. By the end of the summer, we need to raise $125,000 to make sure that we're good from the summer to the end of the year. And I said, all right, cool. Let's pray. And he gave me that look. Y'all know that look when you're talking to somebody who is a believer, but, but you know they want to work hard to make it happen instead of just pray. So he gave me that look. And I understood that look. And I said, well, who knows what God might do? So let's see what God might do. So we pray. After we pray, we're in another meeting talking. And he's like, hey, aren't we supposed to get money from? And he says, who are we supposed to get money from? He's like, well, you reach out to them. So I reached out to them. They give us money each year. And so when I reached out to them, that person that I reached out to said, Hey, man, I did some digging. Not only did we not send you the money that we normally send this year, we didn't send it last year. So we actually are going to double the check and send it to you. Now, remember, I said 125000 This is the way maker. Change is coming. You remember that I said we need 125000 right? So they sent us a $70,000 check. This is like a week after we prayed. $70,000 check. So more than half of what we need already provided a week after we prayed for it. Now, some of you are looking at me like, I didn't pray like that before and it hadn't happened. I didn't pray like that before. Y'all know my story with Judah? I didn't pray like that a bunch of times and God didn't do it. What I've learned is he's the way maker. Just because he doesn't, doesn't mean he can't. I just need to stop focusing on what he's not doing and focus on what he is. Focus there. So we prayed, 70,000 shows up immediately. I'm like, word, hey, let's see what else God might do. The same folks from last year that give us money, uh, he kept, my director of finance kept him, hey, have you talked to him? Have you talked to him? Yes, I've talked to him, but they haven't given me anything. I don't know what's going on. Talked to him again yesterday. I don't know what's going on. He said, well, we need to, you know, we still need to, we still need to raise this money. I'm like, all right, cool. Um, God knows what he's doing. He himself was in the office and he said, man, I feel like I need to go check the mailbox. Brother, if you need to go check the mailbox, go check the mailbox. He goes and checks the mailbox, $35,000 check in the mailbox. So now we're up to like 104, 105,000, right? So I'm like, look at what God is doing. Every time you come to me and say we need to do something, <laughs> there's another check or two that shows up. So I got a call on, I think it was Tuesday of this week from somebody that said, hey, there's this person that wants to send you a check. Where should we send? They didn't even tell me how much. They just said, where should we send the money? So I tell them the address of City Kids. Um, she says, okay, thank you, and hangs up the phone. So I forgot about it, to be quite honest with you. That was like Tuesday. I got eight kids. Get off me. I didn't remember. Today, as I'm getting prepared to come to talk with y'all, um, I get a call from my director of finance. And he's like, hey, man, we got a $30,000 check. And I'm like, we did? He's like, yeah. Who from? He tells me. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I said, now, now, and I called his name. I said, you in March were freaking out saying we needed 125000 in order to take care of everything. God has provided 134000 and the year's not over yet. So you need to tell the entire team. Because y'all know what people say. You can't just sit in your office and pray. That's exactly what we did. I didn't go ask none of them people for money. Like the most thing I did, the faithful thing that I did was somebody who normally gives us money, I just asked them if they had given us the money because we didn't know if they had or not. That's all I did. The one who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, he brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. That, that's the way maker. That's the person that I serve. And I think we don't appropriate the fact that we worship the God of the universe who can do absolutely anything. I think if we actually believe that, we'd live very differently. But because sometimes we think we got to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, we got to man up or woman up and make it happen. We think God doesn't love us, God doesn't like us, God just wants us to go through things hard, wear clothes from Walmart and marry somebody ugly and move to Africa. That's what we think God wants for us. <laughs> you're laughing because you know it's true. You think that sometimes. You just think, God, why do you want my life to be as hard as you can possibly make it? Why does everything have to be this hard all the time? Anybody want to coach? In this room, if anybody want to grow up and coach, cool. For all of you raising your hands, I just want you to think about this. For all of you not raising your hands, you probably are going to coach. 
I'm kind of joking. We were joking the other day. A lady was telling me uh, she's now in full-time ministry right where I live. And previously, she was in, Al- in Alaska, uh, moved from Virginia to Alaska. And she said that she said to the Lord when she was in college, I think, or after college, she said, God, don't move me anywhere cold. And then she became a missionary in Alaska. So we jokingly, right after she said that, we jokingly went, Lord, I cannot be a missionary in Hawaii. I cannot, I cannot love you well in Tahiti. I cannot go to Bora Bora and be a Christian just so, just so he can move us to those places. I just thought that was fun to share. It has nothing to do with the message. Um, the way maker is the one who wants to make a way for you. God is not in heaven. In fact, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, one of the most misquoted scriptures in athletics of all. Like we get it tatted and everything. And we think it means I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength as if all things is the focus. All things is not the focus. In fact, verses 11 and 12, what Paul is saying is I've learned how to be absolutely broke and I've learned how to have a lot of resources. Then he says, I can do all things. What he means is whether I'm in plenty or in like, whether I'm in plenty or in want, The only reason I can do anything that I'm doing is because Christ is the one who gives me strength. In fact, in verse 19, he says, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. This is what I said to my kids this morning as I dropped them off at school. So I was praying with them. I said, the thing is, we just don't know what we need. But God is supplying everything you need. You know, in America, we we act like needs. What we need versus what we actually need is two very different things. I've had this conversation all over this country where people are saying, but I need dot, 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 dot. But when they say what they need, it's like, so do you know what a technical budget is? Like, you don't need what you're saying you need. Like, you would you would not die if you didn't have that. Yes, I would. You wouldn't die if you don't have an iPhone. I promise you. If you did not have the latest iPhone, you would not die. Like, life wouldn't be as cool for you. But you wouldn't die because you can't eat it, right? Like, there are other things that you absolutely need. The reason that I'm saying that is... Christianity is very simple. We make it very complex because it's easier to not do what we're supposed to do. If I can make it real hard, if I can make it real complex, if somebody once said it's simply profound and it's profoundly simple, all God is asking you to do is obey. We're studying through Joshua as a staff, and uh, there's a text in Joshua chapter 5 where as they're getting ready to go into Jericho, so many cool things in the book of Joshua. I'm trying to stay right here in Isaiah, but I got to go. I got to go. Just follow me. Follow me. Follow me. In Joshua chapter 5, Joshua, after they eat manna, runs into a man and he says, are you for us or for our enemies? And this person that he meets says, no, but as the commander of the Lord's army, I have come. Now, as we were looking at that as a text, it's, it's almost like the commander goes, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, no, hold up. We're not, we're not even doing that. You get in to ask me where my allegiance is and what side I'm on. That's not your question. Let me, let me remind you of who I am. Let me tell you of who I am. And some of us are going to God in prayer and we start with what he can give us, the, ben- the, the benefits, instead of remembering who he is. I just want to remind you, he's a way maker. So whatever you're facing that you're like, I don't see how this is going to happen. He does. He's the only one who knows how it's supposed to work. So if I were you, I'd spend the most time with him. Joshua spends time with this person. He actually says, uh, what would you like to say to your servant? And that man, the Bible says, which we believe is the pre-incarnate Christ says, take off your shoes for the place on which you stand is holy ground. And there's a small phrase in that text that if you miss it, you'll miss the simplicity of scripture. The text says, and Joshua did so. That's all. The text does not say, and Joshua went and bought some new Nikes and like Joshua just took his shoes off. All God wanted him to do was take his shoes off. Wasn't hard. Very simple. Just take his shoes off. You know what's crazy? When the Bible was written, there were no chapters, no verses. If you actually read chapter five and chapter six, it flows perfectly, but we often miss it because there's a break. But the next verse says, then the Lord gives him the instruction on how he's going to take care of Jericho, right? And what are you supposed to do? Just walk around Jericho. Listen, if he can't take off his shoes in obedience, you think you're about to walk around a wall for seven days. Consequently, here's another thing that's for free. It technically has nothing to do with the message unless it does. And we'll figure that out. In that text, Joshua says, as you walk around, I want you to blow this ram's horn, this trumpet. And the Hebrew word for ram's horn or trumpet right there in that text is only translated three ways in the Old Testament as far as I know. It's a Hebrew word that's translated ram's horn, trumpet, and jubilee. Now, for those of you who know what the year of jubilee is, it's a year of freedom where all of your debts are released and everything is restored back to you. And what the Bible teaches is they were supposed to walk around this wall where victory is supposed to happen. Remember, Waymaker, like it doesn't make any sense that they're walking around this wall to get victory, but they're doing the victory march before they play the game. And all they're doing is blowing this trumpet 
that is the equivalent of the idea of Jubilee. All they're doing is walking around blowing this idea of victory and freedom every day. And then they go home. Next day, then they go home. Do you know that the Bible teaches that right before Jesus returns, what will happen? A trumpet will blow. And for the first time, the other day, as we were studying Monday, as we were studying, it, it clicked. Yo, the Waymaker gave us a way, even in the conquest of Jericho, to see what he's going to do. Because they blew the trumpets before they went into victory and conquest and freedom. And the trumpet's going to blow, and we're going to enter eternity, and there will never be another seizure like my son has. There will never be any more cancer. There will never any, be any more night, no more death, no more tears, no any of that stuff. And we'll enjoy heaven forever. Why? Because the waymaker said so. Notice that he says, uh, indeed, before the day was, verse 13, I am he. There's no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work and who can reverse it? So if you are the type of person that is looking at God going, man, I don't know what's going on. Just remember, he does. And change is coming. He's the waymaker. Last but not least, verse 14 and 15. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel. I am your King. This is what the Lord says, the one who makes a way in the sea, the one who makes a path through the mighty waters, the one who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it will spring forth. Will you not know it? Here's the beauty of it. I don't know all that God is doing with my son Judah. I know some of the stuff he's doing, and it's undeniable. The people who have come to faith by listening to his story, undeniable. I just went and spent time with somebody and their family that I hadn't seen. Well, I'd seen the person, but I hadn't spent time with them. As I'm spending time with this family, this family then tells me that I haven't spent time with, I mean, I really hadn't spent any significant amount of time with this family in easily 19 years, easily. The wife of this family says, I read Kendra's posts all the time. Kendra is my wife. And her life is constantly affected by what is happening in my wife's life with what's going on with my son. As I just shared with that family, I remember one nurse who came to faith when we were in the hospital with Judah in 2017. I remember looking at her and I said, God loves you enough to put my son in a coma so that we can have this conversation. I said, if that monitor wasn't beeping right now, if you didn't need to give him one of these 15 minutes that he's on, at this moment, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. God loves you that much. So whatever you're going through at this moment, I just need you. I know I'm spending a whole lot of time on a way maker, but that's intentional, right? Because we forget who God is. And we think it's about going from worship to working. Like you worship God and then you work for him. That ain't how it works, y'all. Worship moves to willingness first. Take off your shoes. That's all he said to Joshua. I just want you to take off your shoes and hang out. So often we want to do something for God instead of just being with him. Now I got to tell the story because it came to mind. When I first got married, it was 2006. I'll never forget this moment. My wife had gone down to work out at the YMCA. It was like 12 miles away. She went to work out. I was at the house and I decided I was going to clean the entire house. I was going to wash all the clothes, fold them, dry them, and put them away. I just need y'all to know. I got eight kids now, all right? To wash, fold, dry, and put them away is like remarkable. Because cause, cause washing and drying ain't hard. Even folding sometimes ain't hard. It can be therapeutic. Putting them away takes some time. So I had done all that. I was on my last basket of laundry. My wife walked through the door looking dead dog tired. And I said, because we was newly married, so you can imagine where my mind was, just to be honest. And so uh, I was thinking, it's like, this, this lady going to love me. And so um, I'm going to say that again. This lady going to love me. I've done all of these things for her. This lady's going to love me. So she comes through the door. I'm on the last basket of laundry. She sits down on the couch. I will never forget this moment. Never forget this moment. Maybe this will move me into point number two. Point number two is the wayward. Never forget this moment. She sits down on the couch. I'm folding laundry, and she says, so what would you do while I was gone? Y'all laughing because you know my mind immediately went, do you not look around and see nothing on the, like, what are you? So I couldn't say that, right, because I'm thinking that's going to ruin everything. So I go, oh, I just cleaned up the house, <laughs> took care of the dishes, folded in the laundry, put it away. This is my last basket. And she's like, okay. I'm expecting her to be impressed. Y'all laughing because I'm expecting something more than that, right? Like you're the most awesome person ever. It's not what she says. The next thing that happens is I'm folding this laundry and she's, I was standing up folding it and she said, hey, can you come sit over here with me? And I was like, absolutely. Once I finish this laundry, because I'm going to finish this 
because I'm thinking this is flirt moment, right? So now I'm trying to play hard to get is what I'm thinking. So I'm like, I'm going to finish this basket, and then your boy come and sit down, and we'd be good to go. <laughs> so she looks at me like I'm a weirdo or an alien ruining the moment because I'm thinking this is supposed to be a moment as I'm folding the laundry. I just want you to come sit with me. I just want you to come sit with me. Dead dog tired from working out the while. She comes in. She wants to sit down. But I'm thinking, hey, but I'm, do, do you see what I'm doing for you? If you look around, can you see all of the stuff that I've done for you? Now, I know you want me to sit next to you. But listen, once I finish this, I will have done all of this for you. She don't want that. She want me to sit next to her. She wants to spend time with me, quality time with me, one-on-one looking into my eyes and hearing what I got to say or telling me about her experience at the Y. That's not where my mind was. It was in me getting something that I desired from her instead of me just wanting her. Some of us do the Lord the same way. God, do you see what I'm doing for you? I'm sharing the gospel with my teammates. I'm getting made fun of for not doing everything that they do. God, look at all that I'm doing. You need to hook me up. We losing? Like, I need you to hook me up. God is just saying, take off your shoes, hang out with me. Don't be wayward. What do I mean by wayward? Verse 22, God says, I've done all of these things. He even says, I chose you. Listen, verse 21, this people I have formed for myself, they will declare my praise. He's talking future tense, but you have not called upon me. You have been weary of me. You haven't brought me to sheep for burnt offering. You haven't honored me with your sacrifices. In other words, you're going through the motions, like you're doing all the stuff, but it ain't real for you. No different than, my wife could have said this that night, right? She could have said, yeah, you cleaned up the house, but, but you're not doing that for me. You're doing that for you. And she would have been right. I'd have been heated, but she'd have been right. I was doing that more for myself. And some of us are serving Jesus for us. We're trying to get something from him instead of just understanding who he is. But listen to me, change is coming. He's doing something new. That's why you have been restless. That's why you've been, it's been hard for you to look at your own eyes in the mirror every day because change is coming. He's doing something. You just got to let it happen. You've been trying to fight it and buck. Let it happen. The wayward. You have bought me no sweet cane with money. You haven't satisfied me with the fat of your offerings. You've burdened me with your sins. You've wearied me with your iniquities. In other words, hey, instead of you actually honoring me the way that you said you would honor me, instead what you've done is trying to get me for your own benefit. And that in and of itself is missing the mark. That's not what I want from our relationship. It's not what I want from you. It's not what I desire. Folks, if that's where you are tonight, the encouragement is change is coming. The reason I spent so much time on Waymaker and less time on Wayward is because you don't have to stay there. You can turn around. You do not have to be hard-headed. As I tell one of my kids, I tell several of my kids this, but one kid in particular, I look at her every day and I go, it is your choice whether or not she's going to be lazy. You do not have to be lazy. You do not have to eat a bowl of cereal in the living room and leave your bowl on the couch. You don't have to do that. You can take it into the kitchen and you can wash it out. No problem. It takes more time, Dad. This conversation takes more time. Right? It's so funny. I tell my kids and, and, and had a conversation with them last night. I said, y'all get mad at me when I sit there and hold you accountable. Don't you know if you did the right thing, we wouldn't even be having this conversation? I'd be sitting here saying, let's watch Rebels. Like, we'd be doing something else. But because you don't want to listen to me, now we have to have the conversation about you not listening to me. All of my kids, um, when they start walking, I love um, all ages. My son, Asher, right now is five years old. He's right at that age where he knows when he does something wrong. And when he does something wrong, I'll call his name. And he knows that he did something wrong. And I'll say, come here, buddy. And he's like, what? And I'm like, buddy, buddy, come here. Yes, yes, buddy, come here. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, dude, it don't matter how many times you answer. I, come to me. So finally, he'll come to me and he'll be walking. He's got the most beautiful hair. And he'll be curling his hair and walking real slow because he thinks I'm about to get disciplined. He's playing with his ears. He's sucking his fingers because he's just trying to look as cute as possible. He'll only get that behind torn up, right? <laughs> Asher comes to me and I go, hey, man, do you know that that's not acceptable? Yes. I'm like, cool. I love you. I'll grab him. I'll squeeze him. I'll kiss him on the forehead, pat him on the behind, tell him to run along. Then I'll call him back and I'll do it again. Then I'll call him back. And you know, the third time he like, I ain't got time for that, man. I'm playing something. I just want to remind him, hey, dude, like 
you don't have to stay, like our relationship doesn't have to stay broken because of your sin. I actually love you. I want to keep loving you, even though you just did something you ain't supposed to do. Y'all know God is the same, right? Some of us, like once we sin against God, we're like, he doesn't want to talk to me. That ain't true. Not only does he want to talk to you, he wants to talk to you in that moment to remind you. Like when Asher or, or any of my kids, at the moment that they sin, that's the moment I want them to know, yo, I ain't going nowhere. No, I'm going to tear that hind end up, but I ain't going nowhere. Like I'm going to discipline you, but that's because I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't discipline you. I wouldn't care what you did. But I care about you, and that's why I'm disciplining you. So you can understand the standard. Last one, the way forward. He says, I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. There is an omniscient God who cannot have a new thought and technically cannot forget an old one, yet he says, I will not remember your sins. That is crazy. What does he mean by I will not remember your sins? What he means is I will not treat you as your sins deserve. It doesn't mean I won't know anymore. In fact, people act like this text means he will never mention it again. No, he literally is saying what they haven't done. If you look through the Old Testament, he's constantly saying, y'all didn't listen to me in Egypt either. So it's not like he doesn't cognitively remember. What it means is even with the cognition that he has, he doesn't treat you the way you should be treated based upon your sin. I'm going to say that again a different way. When you break his heart, he doesn't treat you like you broke it. I have this conversation with my kids and myself all the time. When somebody breaks your heart, offends you in some way, how do you treat them? According to what the model prayer says, forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. What we're saying is, God, I want you to treat me like the people who have hurt me, how I've treated them. Have you ever thought about that? That that text actually says, forgive me like I forgive other people. So if you're the grudge holding person in this room, what you're literally saying is, hey, God, the same way I'm holding grudge against Jerusha, who stole my boyfriend, whatever. If you know somebody named Jerusha, that was just for you. All right. um, <laughs> but the way I'm holding this grudge against whoever, against my coach or whoever, the way that I'm holding this grudge, God, I want you to do the same thing to me. Can you imagine if God treated us the way that we treat each other, what life would look like? So. I think this is where I'm going to end because this is a text that has rocked my world. Isaiah 42, you can actually turn back there if you want, verse 8. The Lord says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with another. In John 17, as Jesus is praying, this is the Lord's prayer. He says, and the glory you now you gave to me, Lord, I now give to them that they may be one as you and I are one. So somehow Jesus extends his glory that he shares with God to us human beings. So God said, I ain't doing that. Now, is this a contradiction in terms? No. It's a faith wall that is a belief that if we embrace it, it changes everything about life. What Jesus is saying is, I'm making them like me so that when God looks at them, he sees me. When God looks at them, he sees me. What would your life look like if you start, so I play with my kids and I go, y'all love Jesus? And they go, yeah, what's his last name? And then they all look at me and they go, what you mean, what's his last name? And then my oldest son will say, of Nazareth, or something like that, just to be funny. And I said, you know, just imagine his last name is Christ, right? If that's his last name, Christ means anointed one. If his name is Jesus Christ and I become his brother and he's the heir of all things and so am I with him, according to Romans 8, I'm a joint heir. If I start imagining my last name is Christ, how many of y'all grew up with a last name that meant something, right? Your parents come to you and go, hey, we, and then you say, like my dad, hey, we popes, we won't do that. I say to my kids, hey, you're a pope. You don't do that because my last name means something. Start imagining if your last name was Christ, how differently you would live. Like if you, if I saw myself as Timotheus Christ, my life would likely look very different than if I see myself with a different last name. Why? Because I know the name that I'm ascribed to. I remember when Michael Jordan was doing his Hall of Fame speech, he said to his kids, I wouldn't want to be y'all for nothing because y'all can't do nothing because of my last name. And it's true. Just heard Deion Sanders say recently, hey, if he wasn't my son, y'all would pay more attention. But because of that last name, he's getting the... He's getting the short end of the stick. I just need you to know, if your last name was Jesus, your, was your last, last name was Christ, you'd live very differently because your identity would be rooted in being his. Can I tell you something that you may not know? That's still true whether or not you believe it because he's our brother, according to Hebrews chapter two. God has given 
Jesus a name that is above every name. Guess what? He's made us one with Jesus, according to John 17, and then has called us to be one with each other. And guess what? If God set his glory on Jesus and Jesus set his glory on us, that means God's glory is set on me and he can look at me and see Jesus. That means God's glory is set on you. And when I look at you, I can see Jesus. No matter how much you hurt me, no matter what you do, I can do the same as God would do with me. I can do that with you. Can you imagine how world would look if we looked at each other like our last name is Christ? Not just Timotheus looking at Timotheus Christ, but me looking at you like your last name is Christ. How differently would I treat you? I said to my kids, if Jesus told you to wash the dishes, would you do it differently than you're doing it now? Yeah. Got it. If you knew Jesus was standing right behind you, would you be doing the dishes different than you're doing it now? Yeah. <laughs> you know he's here, right? Like you, you know he can see you. Then I have to appropriate that. Hey, if Jesus was in the passenger seat, would you be driving like you're driving? Would you be doing the stuff that you're doing? Would you be saying the stuff that you're saying? The way forward, I told you all change is coming, but the way forward is going to look one of two ways. Either you're going to recognize, yo, I'm looking at Jesus like a sugar daddy at this moment, and I want him to give me stuff. Right? But I need that to change. I need to look at him as the way maker, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He owns everything, my, my heart included. And I need to bow down to him as king first. That's one option. Option two, you're going to keep looking at him differently than he should be looked at. And you will find yourself continually frustrated because you're not really appropriating who he is. In the words of Neo, where we go from here is a choice that I leave to you. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to make the choice to follow you, the way maker, to have you in mind and at heart, to never lose sight of the fact that you are God and that you are working for your glory and for our good. There are people in this room right now that have resonated with the things that have been said, that have places where they're not quite sure what's happening, but you reminded them tonight that you're the way maker and that they need to trust you. We need to trust you. There are people in this room right now that have also been reminded that they have been wayward. They have been looking at you, trying to get stuff from you instead of thinking about you for who you really are. Then, Lord, there are people in this room that have just been so frustrated recently. They don't even know what it is, but everything has been kind of difficult and there's this uneasiness. Pray that you remind them that right now that uneasiness is that shedding of the skin. Like when a snake grows, it's that shedding of that skin is changes coming and you want them to move deeper, richer, fuller, closer to you as you burn away the dross. Help us to live in that freedom and that jubilee. In Jesus' name.